Well, as we head towards Christmas, um, of course, we, we're reminded of the birth of Christ and those beautiful words that come out of Isaiah 9, which say, for unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given. And those beautiful words that Isaiah the prophet bring to us uh, adorn our um, Christmas cards and our decorations because it's a prophecy that came in from 800 years before Christ was born. The prophet Isaiah lived during a rather tumultuous time. He, he lived through the uh, reign of four different kings. Uh, he died of old age. Sadly, he was put to death by, the, by a king who had rebelled against God, but uh, he had this amazing story. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to jump into Isaiah's life and have a look at what it was that the nation of Israel was experiencing prior to that prophecy that was brought about by Isaiah that talks about a child being born. Uh, where our hope has been given. You see, the thing about the Bible is that it tells us of our own human experience. How many of you have been there and you've read Scripture and you go, poor, dude, that's me. You know, that's my experience. That's how it's worked out for me. Or maybe the other side of it is, this is what gives me hope for how it could work out for me. Is that true to you? That's how Scripture works. There's repeated themes within Scripture that are reflecting the human experience, and it doesn't matter whether you drive a Toyota or a donkey. The human experience is still the human experience, okay? And God is the same God today, yesterday, and forever, okay? Um, so what we find when we look in Scripture is these repeated patterns that give us comfort. Let me give you an example of that. In the book of Revelation, you've got this huge drama of how it is that the end times are going to roll out, this massive picture of cosmic forces uh, pitched against each other, and its imagery is amazing. And yet, when we look at world history, we see how good has overcome evil repetitively. Good has overcome evil repetitively. And so you've got the book of Revelation being outworked in small print before it's worked out in large print. Does it make sense? So the principles of God are the same, and they keep on being uh, manifest in front of us for our excitement to be able to see it happening and for our encouragement. So let's go back 800 years before Christ and drop into... Israel, which was actually a separated kingdom, a divided kingdom, which it always was for a large portion of its history, 10 tribes, which we call Israel, and then two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, uh, which were the southern tribes. And so they were the tribes and how they separated themselves out. The prophet was speaking to both the tribes at the same time. The north of, of Israel, there was a nation called the Assyrians. And the Assyrians were a brutal people, brutal people. They preceded the Romans uh, in respect to their ability to um, create an empire. And they were feared because they had captured or tapped into this amazing technology called the Iron Age. So they had iron wheels on their chariots, they had iron shields, they had iron tips on their arrows and spears. And they had these uh, chariots that would have four men in each chariot, a driver, an observer, and a couple of uh, soldiers who were doing firing arrows, etc. And they were just like the military tanks of the day. Uh, the, the Syrians had themselves well sorted, whereby the men would go off to military service and it would work like this. Um, the first year you were, uh, you had to go and build roads or build infrastructure for the military. The second year you went to battle and the third year you went home, hopefully to breed the next generation of Assyrian soldiers. That's pretty much how it worked. And so there was this repeated cycle, but they became very, very professional, very, very good at what they did. But the other thing about them is that they were absolutely brutal in respect to their treatment of the enemy. And uh, stories are uh, told of uh, them decapitating their enemy and the piles of heads that were there were the height of two men. And so that's just hideous, isn't it, when you think about that? But of course, that is what caused the fear. That is why people treated the enemy that way so that the next time you heard about the Assyrians coming to march on your land, you'd freak out and surrender. That was how it always worked, and this is how it largely works still today. So Isaiah is aware that the Assyrians are getting rather, um, how shall we say it, interested in the nation of Israel. And so there's all these different rumors that are starting to develop about how it is that the Assyrians are going to come down through Israel into Judah and take over the land. And the people were very upset about this because this was a real uh, clear and present danger, a real threat. So what happens is Isaiah starts to speak into this, and we're going to pick this up in chapter 8. He goes like this. He says, Raise the war cry, you nations, and be shattered. Listen, 
all you distant lands, he's talking to the Assyrians now, prepare for battle and be shattered. Prepare for battle and be shattered. Devise your strategy, but it will be thwarted. Purpose your, sorry, but it will be thwarted. Purpose your plan, but it will not stand, for God is with us. For God is with us. And so what Isaiah is saying to the people, obviously he's saying, listen, you know, this is a real threat, clear and present danger, but um, let's put some faith in God. And he's speaking prophetically to the Assyrians saying, look, you can have all your war plans, but our God is going to beat you. Our God is going to defeat you. And so he pushes on from here, Isaiah, and he starts to say something rather unusual. He says this. He says, this is what the Lord says to me with his strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. Now, this people is not the people who we've just talked about, the Assyrians. But you see the, the, the double colon there, the colon, and he says, um, this is the people you are not to follow. And he's talking about people in Israel who have got real fear and a real despair about what could potentially happen to them if the Assyrians cross the boundaries. And he says this, um, this is what the Lord says to me with his strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. Do not call conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. So what's going on here, of course, is when you don't know what you don't know, you try to give yourself some comfort by creating a story in your own imagination of how things are being outworked. And it only takes a little bit of information to grow like a seed and people build the rest around it. It's human experience, isn't it? It's normal. Uh, the New Century version of the scripture says it this way. It says, people are saying that others make plans against them, but you should not believe them. Don't be afraid of what they fear. Do not dread those things. Other scriptures talk about uh, people are saying that there is an alliance being built. Okay, so nations are conspiring together to ensure that we meet our downfall. Okay, so what we're finding is this whole play it again scenario being outworked here because time and time again, there's been wars and rumors of wars, stories upon story of how it is that nations are going to beat up on one another. I've just been um, doing some study on the person of Julius Caesar, one of the most formative people in Roman history, and he preceded Jesus by about 100 years. But again, his campaigns were absolutely brutal. Uh, he was a Roman uh, emperor and uh, Caesar, and he took his armies into France, known in that time as Gaul. And um, there was three million people in Gaul at the time. He put a million to the sword, took a million into slavery, and a million were left. Now that's just mind-blowing, isn't it? But that's the way wars were waged. And so you can see how it is that people were fearful all throughout generations. And if we really want to be serious about where we are in history right now, we have lived in a period of utopia relative to our previous generations. Because for largely since World War II, our, our nation's been free from the ravages of war. Of course, there's been the Vietnam, the Korean conflict, etc., and the Middle East. But um, it was Erwin Rommel who said, he's a German general, he said that every nation should be able to go to war every 20 years because it only takes 20 years to raise a generation to be able to be the next military uh, machine. So you can see how blessed we are. But in a, na in a time, a season when war was normal, um, it was always a, a real reality that the neighbours were to come rattling through and take out your village, wipe out your family and put you into slavery. The thing about these rumours and that we, we hear and we experience even today is this. And I'm quoting a guy here who um, was a, a emperor or a Caesar 100 years after Christ, a guy called Marcus Aurelius. He says this, everything we hear is an opinion, not a fact. Everything we see is a perspective, not the truth. Now, nothing's more true when it comes to rumors and, uh, and things. So we see how it is. Again, we're seeing how history has outworked itself, outplaying itself repetitively. Now, I was uh, reading a book a couple of months back, and I came across a word that I'd never seen before. Uh, the word is furphy, F-U-R-P-H-Y. How many of you know what a furphy is? A few of you do? Yeah, it's only a few. It's an Australian slang term, and it came out of World War I. Um, now, this is how it happened. In World War I, when the troops were up against, you know, in the, in the battle lines there, uh, the um, 
the military would provide water for their canteens or for their cooking. And these trucks, or whatever you call them, were called furfies because they were made by a company called Furfy. All right? So what has that got to do with this? Well, this is the Wikipedia definition of the word furfy. A furfy is Australian slang for an erroneous or improbable story that is claimed to be factual. Furfies are supposedly heard from reputable sources, sometimes second-hand or third-hand, and widely believed until discounted. So what you've got is hanging out at the water cooler. What you've got is people talking about what they've heard, what they've seen, what might be happening. And you can imagine that in World War I, and these, these are Australian troops here hanging around the furfy, getting their water for the, for the week or the day. And you can imagine how these folks would come from different ends of the trenches and they'd be talking, what's happening up your end? Oh, well, we heard the other day that Kitcheners want to do a big, big push. You know, you're going to be doing this and doing that. Oh, no, no, we heard that the Kaiser's wanting to do this. And so we can expect, we heard, and it goes on. And so a little bit of truth with a little bit of uh, fat added to it becomes a wonderful story, a furphy. And uh, if you look up, um, in true Australian fashion, if you look up furphy and on Google, you'll find that they've now got a beer called Furfy, which probably helps exaggerate the truth even further, <laughs> I would imagine. I would imagine. Um, but uh, a Furfy, I thought it was pretty cool. Pretty cool story. But it just shows you how, again, patterns are repeating themselves. All right? So here we have um, a picture that Isaiah has painted for us of how the world, from their perspective, Israel's perspective, looked. They were under threat. They were intimidated. And um, so Isaiah says this, Do not call conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. So he's drawing a a distinction here between fearing the enemy and fearing God. And it's not fearing God in that traditional sense of God's going to come and wipe us out like the Assyrian army might, but the fear of God as in we trust God. We're fearful in a positive way towards him. He is holy and, and, and he is one whom we can put our confidence in. I fear him and I fear losing relationship with him. Uh, it goes on to say, he will be a holy place for both Israel and Judah and he will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Now, this is unusual wording because he's talking to the people of God and he's saying, listen, um, God is going to trip you up if you continue to hold on to these beliefs that God is not big enough to take care of the Assyrians. Okay? And what it means is that uh, you will trip up, you will stumble, you will fall. And he says here, and the people of Jerusalem, he will, for them, he will be a trap and a snare. In other words, uh, he will trip you up in your folly. Okay. Why? Because you haven't got your eyes on the right thing. Now, you know that I did it. Most of you know that I did a a few of these Camino walks through Spain, um, big long walks. And I did one back in 2017 with my daughter, Brittany. And one day it was a really hot day, big long stretch of road. And we saw ahead of us uh, another father and daughter combo from England. And uh, so I was walking along, you know, doing my thing. And uh, I, hey, how's it going? And next thing, I'm on my face. I wasn't struck by the Lord. I fell over. Okay? (laughs) And it was one of those split moment things. We don't even see it happen. Clearly, my toe must have hit something. I was on my face. And in that moment, I'm like, when's the pain going to kick in? You know, in those moments there. Thankfully, not too much pain, but a lot of laughter from the guy that I was going to greet. And um, talk about wars and rumors of wars. By the time I got to the next cafe, everybody asked me how I was doing. You know, I was like, are you okay, sir? And it was one of those patronizing sort of talk, you know, things like, you know, you just walked up in your Zimmer frame, you know? Yeah. But the reason I fell over is because I wasn't watching where I should be watching. And so I got tripped up. And Isaiah is using this imagery. Again, we know what this is like. We know what it's like when we start to run ahead of God and put fear instead of faith into place. But um, Paul, sorry, Paul, Isaiah goes on to describe how it is that there's another trap when people are fearful. And it goes like this. It says, when someone tells you to consult mediums, this is just following on from where we were before, and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? So people who are fearful of the future 
are holding on to um, conspiracies, people who are fearful of the future, start going down places they shouldn't be going, you know, trying to get some information from the dead, in this case, spiritists and mediums. And this is totally frowned upon by God. You know, you, you read Deuteronomy 18, it is just black and white. You don't do this stuff. Okay, it's spiritually dangerous. But when people are fearful, they'll do things that they shouldn't do. But then what happens here is Isaiah, again, drills down into the human condition, the human condition, who we are at our very core, when he talks about what's going on here. He says this, When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why should why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. And if anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Now, there's a whole lot of code in here, and I want to unpack it for you because it's not complicated at all. Um, you see there it says, consult God's word, God's instruction and the testimony of warnings. That's code word for the Old Testament law. Okay, God's instruction plus the warnings that come with it. In other words, when you're in the situation and you don't know what's happening, stick to God's word. It'll bring you strength and it'll bring you, bring you comfort. And it says, if anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Now, that's a strange term. We don't use that today, but it describes the peace of God, the light of dawn. You've seen it in people's situations where they're going through deeply distressing times. And you, you look at them and you go, there's an anointing from God on your life right now because there's the peace of God there, uh, the confidence of God, faith in God, and it's all happening in the midst of a really, really traumatic time. How many of you have seen that, experience that yourself? Yeah, that, they refer to that as the light of dawn. And so what Isaiah is saying here is that these people who are running after spiritists, people who are trying to find some sort of theory to give them some understanding of what's happening, they run out of um, peace. They run out of uh, that depth of confidence that they have in God because they've surrendered that to spiritists or mediums or false ideas, okay? And they've, sur- they've walked away from the word of God. But it goes on, it goes on. Isaiah now really drills down even further and he says, distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will thrust and they will be thrust into utter darkness. The latter part of what I just read there describes the state of the heart of somebody who's got absolutely no confidence in anything of the future. But you see earlier on how it is it says that they cry out to their king, they curse their king and their God. Why? Because they've got this picture in their mind of how the way things should be working out. They know there's trouble and there's trouble coming. But in their mind and in their imagination, they've worked out how it is that this is happening, why it's happening, and what God should do about it or the government should do about it. But because the government doesn't respond to their will or God doesn't respond to their best plan, they get angry. So they curse the king and they get angry at God. Can you see this? Does this happen? Yeah, this is how it works. Isaiah has got tremendous insight here. Tremendous insight into the human condition as he sees how it is that people who are pushing back against the things of of what's happening around them in a way that they hold on to a vision or a dream of what should happen and they become a danger to themselves. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a guy that I studied when I was at university and he's a a German theologian who was martyred uh, by the Nazis basically just a few weeks before the end of World War II. And... um, incredibly intelligent guy, incredibly pastoral. He had two PhDs by the time he was 22, okay? Which was remarkable in anybody's time period. Uh, but he was also a deeply spiritual man, and he, he led this community uh, of people who were seeking the will of God together. They lived in community, and he wrote a book as a response to this called Life Together. And in this book, he, he says this remarkable statement, and he says, God hates the visionary dreamer. And you go, hold on, why would God hate a visionary dreamer? Doesn't God talk about us having visions and dreams and having big ideas about what it is that we can do and how God can use us? But he goes on to say how God hates the visionary dreamer because they take their vision and they take their dream and they hold it up before God and they say, this is the way it should be. And when that doesn't come to pass, they get angry with the people around them because they think they're not spiritual enough to see it. 
They get angry with the people around them because they won't hold on to their vision of what they think the future should be. And Bonhoeffer goes on to say exactly what Isaiah says here. They get angry ultimately with God because they feel that they have the word in the way that it should happen and God has let them down. Does that sound familiar too? Is that easy to do? Of course it's easy to do. We all do this. God, I want my, whoever it might be, to get well. You know, my 110-year-old grandmother, I really believe she's going to live and she dies. I'm joking here, of course. But this is what happens. We hold on to these pictures of what we want and then if we're not careful, we can be disappointed rather than comforted by God because our attitude and our mindset is something that we are uh, set in place where we're trying to essentially tell God what to do. Yeah? This is what Isaiah is saying, you don't do. However, what Isaiah does now is he starts to turn this picture, starts to turn this story, starts to move away from this, this horrible condition of being a human being where we, we wonder and we worry and we push back against people and we push back against God when our dreams aren't coming true. And he starts to paint an alternative picture. And how it goes like this. Nevertheless, I like it when he says nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, that's some of the tribes of Israel. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. He's talking here about the very center of Israel, okay? So that there will be um, honor to Galilee and the nations by way of the sea beyond the Jordan. So it's a geographic term. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian, he's talking about Gideon here, thrashing Midian, okay, raised up this uh, scaredy guy. <laughs> um, as in the days of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of the oppressor. Every warrior's boot is used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. Now, Isaiah is painting a picture here of, of victory. He's painting a picture as an alternative reality to what they think the Assyrians are going to do to them. Yeah. So this is what the prophet is doing. This is what prophets do. They put God into the picture and they say, you can expect something different to what it is that you normally would expect from the situation because you are God's people and I'm your God and I'm going to take you through this even though you can't see how it's going to happen. And then the next verse, he says this, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from from this time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So Israel would have been listening to that prophet uh, saying these words back here, talking about how uh, the the oppressor's rod is going to be lifted and they'll be going, yeah, bring it on. Let's have somebody who's going to take on the Assyrians. Yeah, we'll build our own chariot army. We'll have horses bigger than their horses, men stronger than their men, resources coming out our ears, logistics that can take on the finest armies of the world. Give us that guy and we'll go to battle. Because that's how people think. That's how people think. But God says, no, no, I'm going to give you a child. And you go, what? What good is a child? What good is a child in a battle? At a minimum, we've got to wait 30 years for him to grow up and learn something to lead us into battle. We don't want another 30 years of this fear. But God says, no, I'll give you a child because we live in an upside down kingdom and I'm going to show you a third way. Now, the remarkable thing about this story is that um, we see these scriptures that I've just read about unto us a child is born, etc., as a, a picture of Jesus solely. It's not. Because in that moment, in that time, there was a prototype of Jesus. 
Okay, and this is again what happens within scripture. You see the prototype, you see the real thing. Okay? And that prototype was uh, a man called Hezekiah who became king at the age of 25 of Judah. And this is really important because what actually occurs, and this is a tension we struggle to see how, how it works out. This is what really happens. The Assyrians do invade. The Assyrians come down from the north and they start to invade the 10 tribes of Israel and they, they've devastated them. And they get to Jerusalem and they encamp around Jerusalem and hold a siege there. But inside of Jerusalem is this young king called Hezekiah. And he's a godly king. He's already wiped out all of the, uh, the foreign god worship. And here he is encamped by these Assyrians, hundreds of thousands of them, with their chariots and their soldiers and all their food. They could stay there for months. And Hezekiah says, you know what we need to do? We need to pray. So he calls the people together to pray because they're looking for the third way. They're looking for God's way. And then one night something amazing happens. Um, what happens is somehow God stirs up the Assyrian camp as they're there at night besieging the city and the soldiers think they're being attacked. And so what they do is they turn on each other and they have this full-scale war in the middle of the night amongst themselves. And 185,000 Assyrians from Sennacherib's army are left dead. And so they pack up and they go home. And Hezekiah leads his people out. They go, look at what God has done. Look at what God has done. And they pick up all the plunder. They pick up all of the, that's left over. It's truly remarkable. It's a, it's a story not just recorded in Scripture. It's recorded in um, ancient history as well. How the armies of Sennacherib came home uh, completely Sennacherib. <laughs> Do you like that? Com- Completely Sennacherib. I just made that up. That's pretty, praise God. You know, that's, yeah. God's into humor. So this is what the third way looks like. They didn't see that coming. No way could anybody have predicted that except Isaiah. <laughs> he told them right from the outset, you can plot and you can plan, but we're going to defeat you. You can plot, you can plan, we're going to defeat you. And this is where faith exists, people. Faith exists in having faith in God, not having faith in God and then having a hundred of your own good plans as to how you're going to help God and getting angry when none of them come off or when you get thwarted and frustrated and grumpy. You see, we we serve the God of the third way. It goes like this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's third way stuff, isn't it? Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Hold on, I thought it was the angry people who inherit the earth. No, it's the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, these these pictures that Jesus paints are upside-down kingdom experiences. And we can, we can take on God's business for him. We think we're taking on God's business, business for him by being angry, by being sometimes fearful. Uh, and, and yet we're fighting with the wrong strength. And we lose the light of our dawn. We lose our peace because we're not kicking back and trusting God. You know, remember what Jesus said in the upper room. He says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. And we go, yeah, that's great. But we actually interpret this incorrectly. We take the last bit of it and it goes like this. Take heart, I have overcome the world. You go, yay, therefore I won't have any trouble. Well, that's what you think, isn't it? If we're on Jesus' side and he's overtaken the world, yay, no more trouble. But Jesus just said, no, you'll have trouble even though I've overtaken the world, even though I've overcome the world. And so we live in this tension, this conundrum, which was being outlived and outworked by the, the nation of Israel as the Assyrians did come and give them trouble, but God still overcame. And so for all of us, we have this similar experience. We, with our bad theology, can go, in Jesus, I've overcome the world, therefore I will have no trouble. No, 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 Jesus never promised that. But he promised us a third way solution, 
a third way solution, which puts God in the picture and God is glorified through his third way answers. And the ultimate third way answer is what we celebrate next Saturday. For unto us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. Do you notice that? The government's on his shoulders, not Jesus on the government's shoulders. We don't have to. We don't have to fight for that. The government is on Jesus' shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And here's the final comment. The zeal of God is fighting for us. Zeal is the energy, the passion, the commitment, the dynamism, all of the stuff that God can generate. He is the one who's going to make this happen. We are the people of faith who put our hand in the hand of the man who stilled the water. You know that old song. Yeah, we are the people who put our trust in God. And we don't have to fear the future because we live in the fear of God and Living in the fear of God gives us faith and confidence that he will get us through to the other end. And God will, I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's going to Sennacherib all of our problems. Okay? He will. Yeah. Will we know trouble? You better believe it. We promise that. Will we see him overcome? You better believe it. We promise that too. And so this Sunday, or Saturday I should say, when you celebrate the birth of Christ, and you look in that little stable and you see this little helpless seven and a half pound boy, <laughs> you say, that's the answer. That's God's answer. It's God's answer to a world that wants it all to be done by power. And there's God's answer because God's answer didn't come into Jerusalem for his final victory on a white horse. He came in on a donkey. He didn't come to conquer. He came to give it away. This is our Lord. This is our God. This is our way. This is God's way. Play it again, God. Let's stand for prayer. Father, in these days as we uh, anticipate Christmas, we don't just anticipate that day of celebration, we anticipate the busyness. We anticipate the busy shops, the busy roads, the busy families. We anticipate relationships that might be a bit stressed. And for all of us, Lord, we, we can have some fear, but all of this um, is surrounded in this pandemic that we live in as well, which really just adds to the tension. And God, we just want to pray that as we put our hands in your hand, that we can move forward with confidence, knowing that uh, you're the one who's going to deliver. We can have our mighty plans. We can have a whole lot of different ideas. But Lord, we, we, we run the risk of losing what's so dear to us, and that's our peace and our confidence in you. So hold us tight, Lord. We're only frail. We're just like those people Isaiah spoke to. We're vulnerable. We get fearful. We get intimidated. We get overwhelmed. But you've helped people in the past to to, to help them through. And, and we come before you and we humbly ask that you do that for us. Play it again, Lord. Play it again. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.